And continuing with our operant conditioning notes, we just talked about positive and negative reinforcement. Now we need to talk about the schedules of how we reinforce and when we reinforce in order to first learn a behavior effectively and then to avoid extinction. Okay, so quite a couple things to understand as we learn these new vocabulary terms. So the first reinforcement schedule would be a continuous one. This is reinforcing the desired response, like your dog sitting, every time he sits. So every single time it occurs. It needs to be used when initial learning is taking place. Otherwise, for instance, your dog learning to sit or shake or play dead or whatever he does, he's not going to learn it or it's going to take a long time in order for him to understand, oh, she wants me to put my butt on the floor, got it. So you have to use a continuous reinforcement schedule at the outset of teaching a dog or conditioning anyone something for the first time. On the opposite side of the spectrum there is partial or intermittent reinforcement. And this is reinforcing the response only part of the time, partial or intermittent, right? The results in slower acquisition in the beginning, although you have slower results in the beginning, it shows greater resistance to extinction later on. So in using the combination of these two, when you're first starting to condition your subject, you're gonna to wanna to use con continuous reinforcement just to get, the, get them really stamped, the behavior stamped in the organism, right? But then later on, once they are conditioned, you'll want to use partial or intermittent reinforcement in order to have a greater resistance to extinction so that the behavior doesn't go away. Now there's more specifics with this intermittent, okay? So think intermittent reinforcement and then you've got really two, but technically four different types of schedules, okay? So we're gonna learn four new types of schedules all of them being somewhat similar, okay? It's, it's a variation of fixed and variable and ratio and interval, okay? So if something is fixed, it means it is set, right? You know when it's coming. I would write this down like in the margin of your notes, fixed versus variable. And fixed means it's set, you know when the reinforcement is coming. Variable is you don't know when the reinforcement is coming because it's varying. There is no set schedule, okay? So let's talk about ratio schedules, um, one that is fixed and one that is variable. Ratio is about the number of responses or the number of times one responds. So I would make sure you write that down somewhere in your notes about ratio. It's the number of responses. So a fixed ratio schedule would be reinforces a response only after a specified fixed number of responses. For instance, piecework, which is for every square foot of carpet, every 50 square feet of carpet that you lay, you get paid, right? That's the number of things you do. Or um, let's say in like a factory and putting together cars or something. For every third car that you put a door on properly, you are reinforced. You know when it's coming because it's fixed, it's every three times. And it's ratio because it's the number of times you respond, the number of doors I put on the car. Uh, reward cards are the same, you buy 10, you get one free. Or for every 100 points, you get 20 cents off a gallon of gas, something like that. Variable ratio is then varying on the number of responses. So you re it reinforces a response after an unpredictable number of responses. This produces more responding than any other method and is hard to extinguish because of its unpredictability. Gambling is an example here. It's variable ratio, meaning the number of times, because it's the number of times you gamble and you don't know when you're gonna be reinforced. So this one is most resistant to extinction. Make sure you star that, circle it in your notes. Variable ratio is most, ex is most resistant to extinction um, because of its unpredictability. Um, so slot machines or playing blackjack, anything like that, because you don't know when the reinforcement is coming and it's ratio because it's the number of times you gamble.
On the other side of the spectrum is interval. Interval schedules are entirely based on time. It's the amount of time that you spend responding. Okay, so a fixed interval schedule, meaning it's a fixed amount of time. It reinforces a response only after a specified or fixed amount of time has elapsed. So studying for a test the night before, right? And that is the amount of time, and not necessarily the night before, but just studying in general is gonna be interval, but it's only gonna be fixed if you know when the test is coming. So if I know it's Monday right now, on Friday I have a test. So I'm going to be reinforced on a fixed interval because it's about the amount of time I spend studying, not the number of times I study. Another example is getting paid every two weeks. You know that if you work 80 hours, if you're working full time over two weeks, that's time, right, 80 hours, you're gonna get paid at the end of that two weeks. It's fixed, you know it's coming. Variable interval is also about time, it just varies, it's unpredictable. So it reinforces a response at unpredictable time intervals and it produces a slow but steady responding. So a pop quiz is an example here because if it's a pop quiz, you don't know when it's coming. So it's variable and it's also interval because it's the amount of time you spend studying your material. Fishing or stargazing, you don't know when you're going to catch a fish. You don't know when you're gonna see a shooting star. So that means it's variable. It's interval because it's the amount of time you spend fishing or the amount of time you spend stargazing. I would highly encourage you to pause, rewind, go over these reinforcement schedules with fixed and variable and ratio and interval, make sure you understand. This chart shows you what I was kind of talking about before about things being resistant to extinction and how quickly we learn to respond to them. So this blue line over here towards the far left is fixed ratio and that you know when the response or the reinforcement is coming and it's based on the number of responses given in that you learn very quickly, but notice that over time, it's, it, it will eventually drop. It's not as resistant to extinction is what this is saying. Variable ratio is also good at when you first learn, like you're gonna learn or be conditioned to do that response rather quickly, okay? And that reinforcers being those little black tick marks there. But then fixed interval and variable interval, it's, well, with fixed interval, it's rapid responding near the time for reinforcement. So notice that there's a lax in, rein, in the responses because the object or the subject knows when the reinforcement's coming. So they're like, oh, I'm gonna do this like three more times or three more hours and then I'll be reinforced, right? Um, whereas variable interval, there's very steady responding there um, because you they just do not know when the reinforcement is coming, therefore, they're more likely to respond. Okay, let's talk about the opposite end of the spectrum here with operant conditioning. We talked about reinforcements and how that increases behavior. Now let's talk about punishment. Punishment, no matter what kind it is, if it says it's punishment, it will decrease behavior due to an aversive event. So an aversive event that decreases the behavior that it follows, okay? Again, reinforcements will always increase behavior and punishment will always decrease behavior. So let's talk about the ways to decrease behavior. With positive punishment, so if we're looking at this diagram here, with positive punishment, you would administer an aversive stimulus. Administer meaning to give, right, or to add. Again, it's positive, therefore you add a stimulus. So you ask yourself, okay, I'm adding a stimulus, and if it's punishment, that means I'm decreasing behavior. So what do I have to add in order to decrease behavior? So let's say that you miss your curfew, right? You walk in an hour late and your parents are standing there staring at you and they said, I'm going to positively punish you by giving you the keys to my car. That is terrible. 
you shouldn't miss your curfew. And you're thinking, <laughs> yeah, that's going to increase my behavior. Well, then it's not a punishment. Just because it's adding something doesn't mean that it's decreasing behavior. So what aversive stimulus must you add in order to decrease behavior? Some possible examples include spanking, those types of punishment, but then like a parking or speeding ticket, right? It's adding an aversive stimulus to decrease that behavior. So instead your parents would add something aversive. So let's say you've got more chores or you need to go and clean the bathroom right now with only a bucket of bleach and a toothbrush. <laughs> Ugh. or you have to clean the whole house or wash dad's car or something like that, right? That's adding an aversive stimulus to decrease the behavior. So a negative punishment. So we're down here in the bottom of the diagram and you need to make sure that you write down that negative punishment is also called omission training, okay? Omission training because it's the taking away of something in order to decrease a behavior. So the description being it's the withdrawal of a desirable stimulus. The withdrawal or taking away of a positive stimulus. So an example would be time out from privileges such as time with friends which would be grounding, right? So if you miss curfew and your parents say you're grounded for two weeks, they're taking away your time. They're taking away your privileges or a revoked driver's license for having too many traffic violations, right? So taking away the driver's license is taking away or withdrawing a desirable stimulus in order to decrease the behavior. Now, some research about punishment. Although there may be some justification for occasional punishment, it usually leads to negative effects. There's a lot of research about how punishment it's not that it doesn't work, it's just that it works for the wrong reasons and creates other negative effects that doesn't really make the punishment worthwhile. Punishment can result in unwanted fears and that the child is responding in the way that you want them to, but out of fear, not out of the right reasons of wanting to do the right thing. Um, it conveys no information to the organism of what you want them to do. All they know is what they shouldn't do, not what they should do. It justifies pain to others. If the punishment is adding some kind of aversive stimulus that is physical pain, it justifies that you can act this way to other people. Um, unwanted behaviors reappear in its absence. So they learn what they shouldn't do, but that means that you ha they have to learn everything that they shouldn't do, and they just keep trying out different things. And every single time, it's something that they shouldn't do. Aggression towards the agent or aggression seen as okay or right, um, as long as it's used as a means of what normally mom and dad or right, that they say it's okay. Um, one unwanted behavior appears in place of another. And we kind of talked about that before. Okay, so this is kind of like extending operant conditioning, kind of like how we extended classical conditioning, and its extension is cognition. And again, this is with Edward Tolman and the cognition that's added to operant conditioning. So evidence of cognitive processes during operant learning comes from rats during maze exploration where they navigate it without an obvious reward. And I'm hoping that as we talk more that this sounds familiar to you. Edward Tolman found that the rats seem to develop cognitive maps, um, also mental representations of the layout of the maze or the environment, because if they blocked the normal route, the rat found an alternate route. Now, most people watching this video, if you are from my school, you're from the west side. And on the west side, there's like 50 ways to get to everywhere, right? And that if you're on your way to school and there's a wreck and there's a big traffic backup that's going to cause you to be late, you can probably figure out at least three other ways to get to school. You have a cognitive map or mental representation of the different routes to school. You also have, if you were to close your eyes right now, and I said, visualize yourself walking in your front door, walking to your kitchen, getting a snack, and then walking to your living room to say hi to mom, and then walking upstairs or wherever your bedroom is. You could do that because you have a mental map or cognitive map of the layout of your environment, of your house. 
So with Tolman and his research and cognitive maps, the detour, the different route, would be the shortest path around the barrier, even though the rat had not been reinforced for that alternate short path. Brain imaging points to the hippocampus as the structure involved in drawing the cognitive map. That's where all new learning is processed through, right? And that, that's what also helps you to then respond and find, and, you know, respond in a new way to this problem. And then latent learning. We talked about this at the end of our uh, classical conditioning notes, and we're going to talk about some more here. Such cognitive maps are based on the concept of latent learning, which is learning that occurs without reinforcement, but becomes apparent when reinforcement or incentive is given. So Tolman allowed the rats to freely wander the maze for several hours. And then when the rats were later offered a reinforcement, the ones who wandered around the maze ran through the maze more quickly than those who had not been in the maze previously. And a real life example of this based off of the last set of notes, which I would encourage you to look over it again, is when you hop in a car to drive it for the first time, you know what that circular object is in front of your chest, um, the steering wheel without someone telling you because you've latently learned about a car your whole life. It just hasn't been, your learning hasn't been obvious until the reinforcement of a potential driver's license is. Let's talk quickly about biological predisposition. Um, and this is with Marion Bailey. Um, biological constraints predispose organisms to learn associations that are naturally adaptive. Braylon and Brayland, Bailey being her new last name, showed that animals drifted towards their biologically predisposed instinctive behaviors, also called instinctual drift. And this also says that you can't train certain things out of a dog, um, and that a dog is going to salivate in order to better digest his food. They're also going to bark. You can train a dog when to bark, but you can't train a bar the bark out of a dog. You can't train your dog to never bark. It's a natural instinctive behavior. 